Hey, brothers and sisters, it's James here again from Shepherds for Christ. I'm glad that you could join us today and uh, go through the study with us. I pray that you will have this opportunity to open up your Bibles and join in with your own scriptures in front of you so that we can be led together in the Spirit. Amen. Let us start with a word of prayer. Thank you to Heavenly Father in Heaven for your awesomeness. Thank you, Lord, for how you do things through us all. And that you have all called us to preach the word, instant, in season and out of season, at every moment, at every day. And I pray, Lord, that we may be obedient to your still small voice, which is through your son, Jesus Christ, in spirit. And also help to see where the truth in the testimony of scripture is so valid for us and why it is that we need to spend time in it. I pray, to Father, that you will just lift us up into heavenly places in Christ Jesus. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. That you will give me what to say in this self-same hour, that it may not be my thoughts or my words or my understanding, but that it may be yours through me as a vessel holy unto you. I pray to Heavenly Father that all things will be to your glory and honor. Is our prayer in the name and power of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. So today's study is a simple one, but not a simple one. Simple in perhaps what we read, but to live it is the challenge, right? And that is the offense we give through lusts of the flesh, right? So the study is really not just the offense, but rather the overcoming of the fleshly things in this world. So the title really is Overcoming the Lusts of the Flesh which is of the mind and of the body. All right, how? Through the spirit of Jesus Christ and through the belief of the truth. Amen. So we're going to start today in something that is recorded in Deuteronomy. We're going to go through Jeremiah 17. We're going to go through Galatians 5 and then just a few other uh, short sections of the New Testament to get further val validity on what it is that we're studying today but also to, most importantly, allow the Spirit of the Lord to imbue you with wisdom together as we go through this study. All right, so we're going to start in Deuteronomy 5. And the point is in verse 26, but really it is from 22 to verse 33. So let us go to Deuteronomy 5 and let's look at what 22 to 33 has to say. What was given and what was the situation that is being recorded here. I think it's important for us to understand uh, what kind of situation um, was given. Okay. So Deuteronomy 5 is really underlining the setting of the covenant before the people of Israel that have come out of Egypt, as well as the commandments of the covenant which is the commandments of the covenant specifically are the Decalogue. Not the Pentateuch, but the Decalogue. The Pentateuch is everything pertaining to ordinances and types, but the moral law or the Decalogue as we refer to is the commandments of the covenant, right? And these precepts or prescriptions are not subject to change. Okay? So... Moving from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant, it was not about just hearing it or reading it. But now that Christ is the New Covenant, it is imbued or put into you spiritually. Okay? Now, if that sounds foreign to you, I wouldn't be surprised. It sounded foreign to me. And really, the words that we're about to read now make that quite apparent as to why we miss... We took a misstep in the direction of allowing only reading and writing to be the value of a new life in Christ in the new covenant. But reading and writing was of the old covenant because it was given in the Decalogue. It was given in the Pentateuch. It was given to the prophets. They were used spiritually by the witness of the Lord. But it was written in scrolls and papyrus and so on for the people. Right? 
But like it says in the Hebrews that he spoke, God, who had sundry times in diverse manners, spoke unto our fathers through the prophets, through the prophets, through the prophets, has now spoken unto us by his son, by his son, by his son. I'm saying it three times so that we can really get that into our minds. Because it seems that by his son only means by what you read. No. What you read is so that you can relate to the experience that they had with the experience you have. It's two, two distinct things. So understand one thing. The Lord is infinitely more powerful than only something that he has allowed to be recorded. He himself is more powerful. If I asked you the question, who is more powerful or what is more powerful, the lawgiver or the law? The lawgiver. If I were to say to you, who is more important in a court case over a guilty victim or guilty, sorry, a guilty individual, who would be the one that people need or what would people need? More so the witness than the testimony. Because Christ often used words recorded from the prophets, recorded in from the temple, quoting it. Yet the Pharisees and the Jews did not take it seriously. Because when it came out of his mouth, they said, you witness of yourself. But what did he say? He says, my record is true. I do witness of myself, but I have one greater than I, my Father which is in heaven. He witnesses of me. So the witness is far more powerful and far more important than the testimony. That's right. That's exactly what has been said today. It does not do away with the testimony. It gives the testimony more validity to what it is saying. The enemy, why am I saying this? Because I want us to understand exactly what the enemy has actually accomplished. He has tried to take the testimony and put it against the witness. He's taken the scriptures and put it against the spirit until the spirit is gone. Until it's just the testimony. Words off a page. And now we have replaced this very spiritual, invisible power, unseen, with something that is seen and recorded as if it has more power or has more relevance than the, un than the omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent power of the presence of the Lord. That is absolutely wrong. That is actually blasphemous, to say the least. And that's why it means to not blaspheme the scriptures? No. To blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Don't grieve the Spirit of the Lord. If you deny the Son of Man, it will be forgiven you. Why? Because it's recorded. But to deny the Spirit, to deny the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost of the Father and the Son, this cannot be forgiven you. Why? Because you are denying the power thereof. You have a form of godliness, but you are denying the power thereof. Did you catch that? Okay. So, let's take this in all its sternness, because it is a stern one to consider. So, consider this as we read in Deuteronomy 5, verses 22 to 33. <clears throat> this is the response of Israel. And then we're going to see the response of God after it was given, after they were given the Ten Commandment law, the moral law. Verse 22. These words the Lord spoke unto all your assembly. He spoke it in the mount out of the midst of the fire of the cloud and of the thick darkness with a great voice. Because what happened? Christ was in the cloud. In the fire. And then what happened? The cloud and the fire moved to 
the mountain. Ah, it's amazing how we've missed that point. And he spoke. And he added no more. And he wrote them in two tables of stone and delivered them unto me. And it came to pass when you heard the voice out of the midst of the darkness for the mountain verse in brackets for the mountain did burn with fire. No one could go to it. They would die that you came near unto me, even all the heads of your tribes and your elders. And you said, behold, the Lord, our God hath showed us his glory and his greatness. And we have heard his voice out of the midst of the fire. We have seen this day that God doth talk with man and he liveth. He still lives. Interesting. There's a lot of controversy as to who this God is, if it's the Father and the Son. Well, from this description and Christ's own words, you have neither heard his voice nor seen his shape at any time, save two experiences which only a very select few actually heard. Mount of Transfiguration, which is not the Old Testament, that's New Testament, right? And at baptism. Jesus is saying something and his words cannot be made void. And there cannot be a confusion about this either. But there is. Verse 25. Now, therefore, why should we die? For this great fire will consume us. Right? Many people, though, that day, besides the Garden of Gethsemane, or so, sorry, the Mount of Transfiguration situation, when he was baptized, there are those that heard a voice. And there are those that heard only thunderings. Righteous and unrighteous. If you hear the voice of the Lord our God anymore, then we shall die. Now, there is this idea, this ideology, this philosophy that God doesn't speak to his people like this anymore because he said it here and God changes not. God doesn't change who he is. That's what that means. And neither does he do things to suit people. He would do things as he wishes. And he cannot forfeit his own word. Meaning his own son. You see, it's been taken out of context to suit the theological teachings of institutions. Not according to the spirit that delivered this to the people to have it written. Moses wasn't there for Genesis. Yet he wrote it. How? He didn't copy a scripture. He was inspired by the Spirit to write the first five books. Never been there. And it says... Verse 26, for who is there of all flesh that hath heard the voice of the living God? Who is the one true living God? That'll be the Father. Speaking out of the midst of the fire as we have and lived. Ah. Go down here and hear all that the Lord our God shall say. And speak thou unto us all that the Lord our God shall speak unto thee, and we will hear it and do it. Who is the mediator between the one true living God and his people? Christ Jesus the righteous. Who was the mediator of the Almighty to Israel? The Lord of hosts. Because, according to John, he was God. So who is speaking to Moses? The Son of God. As God. Who is the one that is giving the commands to the Son of God? Who is God? The living God. That's exactly what it's saying. We're doing no damage to the language here. But notice the response of God. Verse 28. And the Lord heard the voice of your words, 
when you spoke unto me. And the Lord said unto me, I have heard the voice of the words of this people, which they have spoken unto thee. They have well said all that they have spoken. Oh, that there were such a heart in them, that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. Go say to them, get you into your tents again. Interesting that he says, get you into your tents, tabernacles, temples. Because the reference to tabernacles, even in the New Testament, the word tent and temple are synonymous to a house or to a presence or place of presence where there are people or a person. Are we not in the living temple of the Lord? So get you into your tents, your temples. Listen, the high priest must be in the temple. Are you listening to him? But as for thee, stand thou here by me, because he was the spokesman. He was the spokesman. That's exactly what Moses' function was. And I will speak unto thee all the commandments and the statutes and the judgments, which thou shalt teach them, that they may do them in the land which I give them to possess it. You will observe or be careful to do therefore as the Lord your God has commanded you. You shall not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. You shall walk in all the ways which the Lord your God hath commanded you that you may live and that it may be well with you and that you may prolong your days in the land which you shall possess. Who was the Lord their God? I'm going to say their God because this is speaking of past tense. Before Christ came. The Lord your God. To Jesus he said. I go to your God and my God. Because the Father is the one true living God. Let's make that clear. But at this time Christ had not become a man yet. And everything was done through the Lord. If I say just the Lord. In today's context. Who am I referencing? Christ. So who is the Lord, your God, in reference to the Old Testament? Christ. Because he is the mediator. He is the representative of the one true living God. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. Past tense. This is a past tense piece of scripture. Okay. There cannot be confusion here. I'm not teaching my own thoughts. I'm not teaching my own understanding yet. I'm going according like a child believes what he reads and allow the Spirit of the Lord to attend this in all its understanding. If I cannot rely on the Lord to give me what to say in this self-same hour, then I should just stop doing this altogether. Then no one can have that experience. Then no one deserves to have that experience, right? If I want to go to that extreme. But if the Lord is using me in this in this in this moment, then surely he must be true and I must be a liar. Right? I'm quoting scripture. So is are we gonna focus on the man and find excuses as to why it can't be that way? Or are we going to trust in the Lord to know what he's doing through the person in the self same hour? That's the question. That's really what it comes down to. And why are we putting this today? Why is it starting this way? Well, that's what it means to overcome the flesh. It's the same point. This, it begins here. You shall have no other gods before me. Right? And then it flows to all the rest. And the seal being the Sabbath, of course. But let us go to Jeremiah 17. And see what's advocated here. Let's go to Jeremiah 17. And then we're going to New Testament scripture to confirm these points. That there be, can be no confusion. And when you go to verses 18. 19 onwards. 19 to 27. He's talking about 
look off for Sabbath observance. In fact, Jeremiah 17 verses 19 and 20, 27 sit perfectly well with Hebrews 4 on the Sabbath truth. All right. Okay. But let's start from verses 1 and go to verse 18. The sin or the lawlessness or iniquity of Judah is written with a pen of iron. Iron. Interesting. And with the point of a diamond. It is graven upon the table of your heart and upon the horns of your altars. Interesting. It's engraved on your hearts or on the tablet of your heart and upon the horns of your altars. It's amazing that Jeremiah is saying this because it wasn't fully on everyone's hearts in the Old Testament time, was it? But this is also a symbolic point of Christ himself through his spirit putting it and engraving it on our hearts that we take the heart of stone, which is what iron is, and making it a heart of flesh, one of compassion, one of love. And sometimes love comes in stern rebuke. Verse 2. Whilst their children, remember, their altars and their groves by the green trees upon the high hills. O oh, my mountain in the field, I will give thy substance and all thy treasures to, the spo to thy spoil and thy high places for sin throughout all thy borders. Interesting. O oh, my mountain in the field. Isn't a field below a mountain? A mountain in the field. Ah. Christ is that mountain. He is Mount Zion. And we are the harvest of the field. So he must be in us and amongst us. And I will give thy substance. I will give thy substance. Remember, the Lord is speaking through Jeremiah. I will give thy substance. I will give it to you. Not you will take it for yourself. And all thy treasures to the spoil, all that you have in this world as plunder, and all thy places for sin throughout all thy borders. Why? Because we cannot esteem self here. Self has no presence here. Even for me in this moment, self is taking a back seat. It must. It must take a back seat. I myself, as doing as presenting the study, I must learn personally, me, James, from Shepherds of Christ must learn and have this really hit home. In my own thoughts? No. As the thought of the Lord is using and attending in this very moment. And hopefully that is the same for those that are receiving on the listening end. Most importantly, you should not just be preoccupied with your life like Martha was. You should be listening attentively like Mary and perhaps even have your Bible open and following with. That's the reason why I don't put the scriptures up on the screen. Because that makes it too easy. You should be picking up your Bible. And allowing the Lord. To share with you the same thing in scriptures. That we follow together. And have a study. I might be a teacher. In this sense. But we're supposed to learn together. Right? The only master that is greater than us is Christ. So it goes on. And thou, even thyself, shalt discontinue from thine inheritance that I gave thee. Right? You will let go of what is yours that I gave you. And I will cause thee to serve thine enemies in the land which thou knowest not. For you have kindled a fire in mine anger, which shall burn forever. Why? We are obedient to the thoughts and the intents of our own minds and hearts and sometimes claim it's Christ or claim it's the Spirit. But the fruit that does follow reveals something different. Right? Remember, we are talking about how do we overcome the fleshly things of the heart and the mind and of the body. Here it comes. Verse 5. Thus saith the Lord, 
Cursed be the man that trusts in man or in strength, meaning his own and any other or an institution or taking words off a page according to what you were told through an institution or through someone. It should have been taken to the Lord in prayer in the spirit and he would have made it clear for you if it was right or wrong. This is a habit that I've myself have had to get into. It doesn't matter what someone says to me. I have to be humble and of teachable spirit to take it, to learn it, what they're saying, and then take it to the Lord and have him spiritually in my mind, sift it out to know if it is of truth or error. That's how it must be. Because how do we know what it is? Cursed be the man that trusts in man and who makes flesh his arm. And whose heart departs from the Lord. If this was evident with every single individual Christian or someone who claims to be a Christian or grew up in a Christian walk, why is this not happening in the sense of the gospel being lived and preached on a day-to-day -day basis and not worrying about how much money we must make so that we can square our debts? For one example. Does that mean that we must just sit around doing nothing? No. Don't blanket the simple point with your thoughts. That would be a very earthly, sensual, and devilish thought. The Lord himself said, take no thought of your life. What you will eat, what you will drink, and your body, what you will put on. So does that now mean that Christ's words are not what they mean or not what they seem? No, they mean exactly what they mean. And they are exactly as they seem. But there is a fight between the flesh and the spirit. Here it is. For he shall be like the heath, or he shall be like a shrub in the desert, and shall not see when good comes. He won't even notice it. Doesn't matter who it's through or what it's through. You'll be stuck. Like Jonah. Under the shrub. And when it was taken away the next morning, complaining. But shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness. In a salt land and not inhabited. He will be in a wilderness experience. And in a salt land. What does salt do? It dehydrates you. Salt without water will dehydrate you very quickly. You will not have enough well of life, of, of the water of the life of Christ, welling up into you, constantly flowing and not inhabited. Verse 7. Here it is. Blessed is the man. Blessed is the man that trusts in the Lord. In the Lord. In the Lord. And whose hope the Lord is. Christ said to the Pharisees, search the scriptures, for in them, in them, the scriptures, you think you have eternal life. Yet they are that which testifies, testifies is a record of me, belonging to me. A testimony without the witnessing presence of the Lord is just that, a testimony. Doesn't mean anyone's subject to believe it at any time. I know many folk that have read the Bible many, many, many years and have left the faith. Why? No spirit. They didn't have the greatest power because it is power. This is a focus on power. Absolutely. Our own? No. Submitting to the power of the Lord. In fact, the word power is used more than 80 times in the New Testament. Search it. This is about power. Not a seen one, but an unseen one. And that's what we need in order to overcome all things of the flesh. For he shall be 
as a tree planted by the waters and that spreads out her roots by the river and shall not see, not see when it comes, but her leaf shall be green and shall not be careful, right, or anxious in the year of drought. Notice that word, anxious. Hmm. Neither shall cease from yielding fruit. The fruit of the Spirit, that's right, the fruit of the Spirit, not the fruit of the Scriptures. It doesn't say that. That's what's been implied, supposed, assumed for too long. Are we not reading the Scriptures today? Yes, we are. Absolutely. But who is the one that should be attending us and giving us discernment over what we're reading? The power of the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord. Why? Because Christ is that Spirit. He is the wisdom and the power of God. It's power and wisdom. And He is the full assurance of the wisdom and knowledge of God. If we don't understand this properly, in its simplicity, and in its power, we're going to keep missing it. The heart, and here it is, this is the to debunk the follow your heart idea, follow the feeling, but I feel. Feeling can be deceptive. Thoughts can be deceptive. The heart is deceitful above all things. And desperately wicked or incurably sick. Who can know it? Question. Who can know it? I, the Lord. Absolutely. I, the Lord, search the heart. Who? Not what. The scriptures cannot search, search your heart. The scriptures do not unlock a, an amazing theological understanding that now apparently miraculously wakes up your inner consciousness to see yourself in its true light. No. That would be spiritualistic. That would be mysticism at its best. That would be the entire New Age philosophy. I, the Lord, personally, search the heart. I try... The reins. I test the mind. Of what? Of truth or error. To know if it's truth or error. And anyone that is led by the Lord in that very moment, whenever it might be, is always also testing their brothers if they are of truth or error. Why? Because if that's what the Lord decides in that very moment, that's what it is. The Lord is constantly using people to do that. And this is what was happening in the upper room experience, before they had the full power of the Lord come over them to speak in tongues and to do many miraculous things. There was a, a schism that had to be broken out. And they were there for more than a month, working out these issues and coming to healed at the presence of the Lord. I'm sure some of them got up and be like, oh man, I don't want to listen to you anymore. Right? Oh, you think you're the only one that hears the voice of the Lord. Right? That's how it is today. Or you're the only one that knows the scripture of Jeremiah and Isaiah. Right? Are we listening to what the Lord is trying to teach? Are we always trying to find thoughts or words to match? No. We should be listening, be still, and know that I am God. That includes when he goes to people. That includes when he is speaking. Especially when he has appointed someone to be a teacher. Especially as he appointed someone to do a preaching on the street. To which he has appointed someone to share a text. Or a Bible. Or something in the shopping market. Right? Or to sit with a brother that is emotional. That is broken down because he lost a loved one. Right? It is in our greatest moments of need that the Lord always attends us directly or sends someone to bear the fruit of the Spirit. 
and to give us victory in order to overcome the temptations or the lusts or the passions of the flesh. Absolutely. So he tries the reins. He tests the mind even to give every man according to his ways. He will give you according to your ways and according to the fruit of his doings. This is important. And our doings are our deeds. That's why Christ said, if you don't believe my very words, look at the very deeds of my life and tell me if I am from above. The same can be said about God's people. Look at their deeds. If you don't believe their words or their teachings or their expressions of whatever it is the Lord is burning on their heart right there, for the minds of many, even themselves, look at the way that they live. Look at the deeds of their life. If they are wrought in Christ according to the standard of Christ, according to how the Spirit moves, or according to the doctrines and commandments of men, to be seen of men, to make a show of things, that would be Satan. That would be the false spirit. Verse 11, as the partridge sits on eggs and hatches them not, hatches them not, so he that gets riches and not by right shall leave them in the midst of his days and at his end shall be a fool. I know many ministries that have this. They've got lots of substance, for example, but not sufficient to the day. Sufficient for months on end. Where is the sufficient to the day? This is another qualifying point to overcoming the lust for the love of money. That's right. Because if you have a constant supply, then you don't need the spirit. You've already got the supply. Verse 12, a glorious high throne from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. A glorious high throne from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. Who is our sanctuary? Who is that throne? It is our heavenly father through his son, Christ Jesus. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all that forsake you, shall be ashamed and they that depart from me shall be written in the earth because they have what forsaken the lord not forsaken his scripture because when it refers to the scripture it actually says scripture it's talking about the lord himself that witnessing attending spiritual power the fountain of living waters he said it to the woman at the well in john 4 this is john 4 what I will give them will be like a well of life springing up into everlasting life. Right? A well of spring water sp sp spilling up into living waters. Right? This is a reference to his spirit. This is not a reference to scripture. But that's what it's been told us. That's what we have believed for so long. That you're saved by words on a page. Am I diminishing the scripture? Not at all. I'm saying that the scriptures have been twisted out of their true context. Not following the rules of language. Not following the etymology of Hebrew and Greek. But twisting it to keep people subject to denominational teachings. To ministry teachings. And thereby, no one is in the same mind. No one is saying the same thing. Wrong spirit. Not the wrong testimony, because the scriptures are there. They're still there. We're all reading it. But there's a wrong spirit. The wrong mind. Indeed, traditions of the church. We have followed traditions of our own making sometimes. We sometimes create traditions within our own minds yeah, this makes sense to me, but that doesn't make sense to me. 
that is a tradition within your own mind as well. Because if you come to Christ, it doesn't matter what makes sense to you and what doesn't make sense to you. You should count it all as dung and say, Lord, you make sense to me. Right? And it says, verse 14, heal me, O Lord. Heal, heal us of what? Our doubt, our unbelief, our backsliding, the lust of our flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Pick one or and more. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. You heal me. I can't heal myself. You heal me. Save me and I will be saved. For thou art my praise. You are my praise. Why did David write the Psalms? Are the Psalms themselves Christ? No. He is writing a record so that you can understand what it means to praise the Lord. And now you can relate to the way that you praise to the Lord, that the way you praise the Lord is the same as way David praised the Lord, that you can be in connection with each other, even though he is already dead and you are alive right now. It's for connective relational purposes, to relate to it. That's why it's a relationship, not with the book, with Christ himself, and you can relate to the book now because you have a relationship with the Lord in spirit. Heal me, O Lord. Behold, they say unto me, Where is the word of the Lord? Where is the word of the Lord? Where is it? This is mockery. Let it come now. Right? They want an external sign. And when you are being led by the Lord, through the word of the Lord, through the Holy Spirit, they question it. Exactly. Absolutely. We must be led, not according to a denomination or teaching, and a cropping out of Scripture or Spirit of Prophecy according to what has been taught, but even if it's taught, you should take it to the Lord in prayer and in diligent study of the scriptures too and let his spirit attend your mind and give validity to what is right and what is wrong within what was taught. Even today, as I'm presenting this, don't just take it. Don't just believe, oh, it sounds great. It feels good. No, personally take time out with the Lord as Mary did. Don't be a Martha now. Be a Mary, take the time and ask the Lord to reveal it to you. May his word, spiritual word, spoken in your mind, attend you. And he will give validity to the recorded word which we see here. And it says, verse 16, As for me, I have not hastened from being a pastor to follow thee. Did you, did you catch that? Jeremiah is, Jeremiah is making it clear. As for me, I have not hastened from being a pastor to follow thee. I have not hurried away from being a shepherd to follow you. Did you catch that? That's a beautiful, that's a, such a beautiful point. We don't follow off the shepherds. We are lost sheep. The shepherd himself follows us. Isn't that, ama isn't that amazing? He follows up. He waits for us to be tripped up. And we call upon him. And he picks us up. He is the true shepherd. And then we follow the shepherd. Once after he has found us. If he's not holding us up, truly we are following next to him and we know his voice that when he gives a command, bah, we listen and we do as he speaks. He says, neither have I desired the woeful day. Thou knowest that which came out of my lips was right before thee. There we go. We have to be absolutely sure that what comes out of our mouth 
must be because he's the one that gave us what to say. I am sure that what came out of my lips was right before thee. Why? Because we trust in his thoughts or our thoughts. His thoughts, not our thoughts. He puts it in you to say. And it must come out right. It must come out there. And if it comes out as the Lord has us to teach, exactly, then it doesn't just feel good. It's actually a very convicting thing. Because we are all servants to the flesh. And there is a war between the flesh and the spirit. We're going to read that in a moment. There is a war between the spirit and the flesh. And we're not 24-7, 100% of the time, obedient unto the spirit. But as we have those experiences in the flesh, we hear that still small voice come to us and say, don't do it. I'm with you. Help. Let me help you overcome this moment. And you can either ignore it and fall into the lust of the flesh. And then have to come and repent, groveling to the Lord, saying, please forgive me. How could I have not hearkened unto your voice? And you feel that you are grieving him. This is my experience. Or you can hearken unto that voice and say, yes, Lord, I will not do it. Thank you for giving me the strength right now in the name and power of Jesus Christ. Yes, this is that battle with self. Absolutely. This is what it means. It's that fight between self. Am I going to obey what he says? That, that little conscience in the back of your mind is not you. It is Christ. He is the one that is trying to show you what it means to be selfless, not to give to yourself, to the lust of the flesh, to your own mind, to your own body, what it passions for, but rather to be obedient to the Spirit as you hear that voice talking, invisibly, it cannot be tangibly touched. It is an experience that happens within the deep subconscious part of your mind. It's like at the back of your head. And he speaks to you and you obey. Or disobey. Be not a terror unto me. Verse 17. Thou art my hope in the day of evil. Be not a terror unto me, right? Because when you are about to sin and you hear that voice, you are terrified. But if there is a heart of stubbornness to absolutely still want to do that thing, you ignore it. You grieve the spirit in that very moment. And you don't have hope in that moment, then do you? But once you've done that thing, you feel so ashamed. If truly there is that, that, that unction of shame that's come upon you. And you grieve. Sometimes you cry. But the Lord is ever so hopeful and gracious towards us. That in that day of evil, he comes to us. Because we fear him more than we fear anything else. Verse 18. Let them be confounded. Let them be ashamed that persecute me. And this is for those that actually truly have this experience when they are teaching and preaching and advocating the thing in everyday life. It doesn't have to be a guy like me on a screen here. It can be you in your daily walk. Don't feel ashamed. But let not, let not me be confounded. Right? Let them be confounded that persecute me. But let not me be confounded. Let them be ashamed. I don't want to be ashamed. And when you do things in the Lord, truly as He moves you, you're not ashamed. You feel this absolute victory in the Spirit come over you. And you know you're doing right in Him. And anyone who does righteousness is righteous as He is righteous. Why? Because he's doing the works through you because you obeyed him in spirit and in truth. You understand the, the, the written testimony of scripture. You now not just reading it, you're living it. You're living that. You can now relate because it's the same living experience. That's why he is the hope of life, that quickening, life giving, that living water to you. Amen. 
but let them be dismayed. But let not me be dismayed. Bring upon them the day of evil. Bring upon them the day of shame or doom. And destroy them with double destruction. Crush them. Right? Either we break on the rock, or he will crush us. Right? It's not a comfortable thing to hear, but we need to hear it. It must be convicting. It must rend the heart. That's why the sword is two-edged. It cuts both ways. The dividing of thought, of the bones and the marrows, and the thoughts and the discerning of the heart. It is everything. He cuts you up. That guilt and that shame pulls you out, out of joint. And you must confess. If you don't, you will carry on giving in to the lusts of your own mind, the lusts of your own flesh, and you'll be full of pride of life. Right? We're going to jump into that right now. Let's go to Galatians 5. Let's go to Galatians 5. <clears throat> Galatians chapter 5. Oops, almost missed it. Here we go. Okay. When Christ has set you free, you are in a position of liberty. Liberty is the exercising of freedom. In a nutshell. But we do not do it occasion to the flesh, but in all service towards God. Amen. But let us take this as it is given according to the scriptures here in its own word. And allow the word himself to attend us as we read. Position of liberty, starting in Galatians 5. Stand fast on what? The Lord. Stand therefore. Or stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ himself has made us free. Not the law, Christ. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Right? That yoke of bondage comes in many forms. This is not just an attribution towards the law or of the old covenant. This means anything of the flesh that you are now bound or slave to. A yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. He's not just talking about literal circumcision for the Jews, because who is he talking to here? He's talking to Galatians. He's talking to Gentiles. He's written this to them. But they weren't to be circumcised, right? Literally. They were to be circumcised in the heart. To have Christ live in them. But he says, Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Why does he say this? Look at the next verse. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. If you focused only on, I have a new heart in Christ. That's right. We're not talking about the Jews and the law. We are talking about what? Christ making you free. If you focused only on being circumcised or having a new heart, Focused only on, I have a new heart. You are missing how that new heart is daily renewed in the image of Christ. You have taken the summary, you have taken the box, and taken the contents out of it. You're focused on the box. It's the contents within the box. It's not just the lamp. You need the oil. The lamp without oil, or the box without contents, is just that, a box, a lamp. 
if you are circumcised, great. But that in and of itself does not mean anything because there are many people that have been baptized into Christ, but there has been no subsequent change, no changing or conformed to the Spirit changing them. Is that not the problem with Christian world today? That's exactly the problem. If you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again, I am preaching to you again, to every man that is circumcised, that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Why? Because we are to establish the law. But how is it established in us? Through the Spirit of Christ Jesus, His power. Exactly. It is theoretical, literal from the doing of things, the do's and the don'ts, through knowledge and the exercising of your knowledge now. It's theoretical, but not actually practiced as the Spirit of the Lord moves you to practice it, to live it. It's theoretical, not actually practical. And now it says, verse 4, notice this. You have become estranged from Christ. Christ is become of no effect unto you. Say that again. You see what's missing here. We have no Christ in us doing the work through us. We are trying to attain to doing the same thing that Christ is supposed to do through us in spirit. And we're now doing it according to what we think it says in the flesh. According to words on a page only. Ah, that's the problem. That's why there are so many different theologies. That's why Satan has been able to accomplish so many theologies. Why he's been able to accomplish such a schism between the body of Christ for so long. And it's not just within the seven churches of what happened. It's happened more so now because we're all Christian for those that are Christian. But guess what? None of us are together on anything. Why? Because there's no spirit of Christ. There's a Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, that's Satan. Or there is a spirit of ourselves trying to work this out according to what we think the words say on the page. Problem on both sides. That is the spirit of the Lord's work. That is what the Lord is supposed to give. Exactly. We don't have spiritual discernment as to how we read the gospel, or most importantly, we have no spiritual discernment on how to actually live the gospel. It's supposed to be lived through the Spirit of the Lord, and the Scriptures give validity to that experience, because now you can actually relate to, to, uh, to Paul and what he's saying to Galatians. You can now understand it, because you yourself are living it. But if you're trying to live it through what the Bible is saying, you got it wrong. That's not what it is. You don't live it because you read it and just believe what you're reading. That's not how it works. That is the counterfeit form. Like I said, taking the testimony of Scripture and sandwiching down, pitting against the Spirit of the Lord until He's no longer there. Exactly. It's a written example for our benefit. Absolutely. But Christ is not in himself, literally, zoop, power into the Bible, boom, whoop, power out of the Bible. That's not what it is, but that's how it's been pitched for so long. The Bible is not spiritually alive. It is the living word in record because the living testimonial experience of Christ in you literally, miraculously, spiritually giving that discernment gives validity and makes the scriptures come alive to you. That's the difference. So he says, verse 4, 
Christ has become of no effect unto you. Himself in spirit, literally being the capital W word. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, if you think that you are made righteous, or you think you can attempt to be righteous by the law or by the validity of law, as in the scriptures, because remember, law is three things. It can be a reference to what? The Decalogue. It can be a reference to the Pentateuch, right? Or it can be a reference to the entirety of Scripture and any, and any prophet or any prophetic thing that is given by the Lord through whomever He will. We think that prophets have ended. No. We are to prophesy again. Now. He can use anyone to prophesy. It says through Paul to for those that prophesy, for those that are given to prophecy to prophesy. Some that are teaching to teaching. It didn't end with one person back in the 1800s. That's not what happened. But that's how it's also pitched, right? Through the nominal conference Advent faith, right? I love, I'll, let me clarify this. I love what the Lord has had achieved through William Miller all the way down to the pioneers of Adventism, even through Ellen White, and gave us a behind-the-scenes look as to the actual plans of Satan, which is not recorded in Scripture, Right? It summarizes points that he is the God of this world and the prince of this world. And you can see the lust of the flesh tempting us to the flesh. But actually his plans in detail was written through what we call Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, 2, 3, and 4. Absolutely. I believe that wholeheartedly. Specifically the 1884 one. Absolutely. However, if you do not have the witnessing spiritual power of Christ leading you, you will also take those words on the page and legalistically slap people in the face with a thus saith Ellen White, not a thus saith the Lord through those writings, right? You see the simplicity of what Satan has actually tried to accomplish here, what he's tried to do. He's tried to sandwich away the witness with testimonies, with evidences. And that's, what the, that's the danger of the theological world. That's the danger of the theological institutions. They have taken words on a page and kicked Christ out of the entire pattern and say that it's here. It remains here. God has used messengers, including Ella White, at her time for things that needed to be advocated specifically for her time. She had a lot of other writings specifically for addressing issues at her time, specifically the testimonies to the church. But there are greater issues that weren't even prevalent in her time that need to be addressed now, like this one. How do we overcome the lust of the flesh today? As the scriptures has put in right now, and even as the writings of Spirit of Prophecy have declared, we need the Spirit of the Lord in us working mightily. And also that the testimony of scripture alone is sufficient to give us an awakening of what the Spirit of Prophecy is. Her writings give a punchline, a gut punch to the behind the workings of Satan through the seen and unseen foes. Just to be clear, that you know where I personally stand on this. I believe it. Absolutely. I do not discredit it at, at all. But if we do not have the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord in us, we won't be able to tell the difference. We'll just be sandwiching into people's minds, words on a page, words on a page, words on a page. You must believe what it says. You must believe what it says. But how can you believe what it says only and not love what you're reading? We need to live it. Indeed, we have a lot of work to do as his servants. We are to recall the accounts of Scripture. We are to recall 
the works of the spirit of prophecy. But most importantly, we are called to prophesy again. And the Lord will do that as he wills through his spirit every day through any individual he wishes. Am I clear on that? Do you guys got me on that? Just it's recorded. It's recorded. Never think I'm trying to put the one against the other. Oh, no. Oh, no. No, 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 no. Without the source of that power himself. We can easily misunderstand his testimonies. They are his. They belong to him. The testimonies belong to the witness. They don't belong to us. They are for us, but they belong to him. Just like we belong to him. Let us overcome. Let us read on. Christ has become of none effect to you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law. If you think that you are justified simply by words, you are fallen from grace. You are fallen from grace. You are no longer relying on grace. We are not saved by works. We're not saved, right? By holding of the law. We are saved by the grace of God through faith in Christ Jesus. You cannot see, tangibly touch grace. The Bible records grace, but in and of itself, it isn't grace. Right? Exactly. With true faith comes works. Our works? No. The works of Christ. Because he tells you what to say in the self same hour. He tells you, rather not go there with your big plans. I just need you to go over here for five minutes and speak to that lady over there instead. You'll have more success with that one woman than trying to think that this big plan of yours will convert 10 people. That's how I'm, I'm really giving a, a simple example, but that's I've seen that a lot. Exactly, because we love him and want to please him. Absolutely. But it says here, verse 5, notice what it says, For we, through the Spirit, did you guess that? Through the Spirit, wait, or patiently wait, for the hope of righteousness by faith. What is faith? Now, faith is the substance, the power of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen or unseen or invisible. Right? It is through the invisible that this visible world was made. It is through the Spirit of the Lord in invisible manifestation that we don't see with these naked, carnal, natural eyes. But if we were to see it, it would amaze us. Right? But blessed are those that believe yet don't see. We shouldn't need to see this. We believe it. And that sounds foolish to the world. It's not foolish to me. I believe it. I don't need to see to believe. I believe. And when it suits him, I will see. For in Christ Jesus, notice this, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision avails anything nor uncircumcision. It doesn't matter if you are just have a new heart in and of itself or no words on a page in and of itself. Because you can also commit it to memory. You can also commit it to your heart. And I believe it. I believe it. But that is still your strength. It must be imputed or transferred through his spirit daily as you die to yourself and your understanding of what you think the Bible says. And that's why he said to the Pharisees, search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life, but they are merely what testifies of me. For in Christ, neither circumcision avails anything nor uncircumcision, but what? But faith, which works by love. Exactly. Without love for God and having his love shine through us is for nothing. Then we are of all people, of all Christians, most miserable. And I've seen that in the Christian world. Christians are talking the talk, but they're not walking the walk. In Christ as he leads them. And they are most miserable. They always think. Why am I not achieving this? Because it's theoretical still then for you. It's not a practical living experience. And then he says. Notice what he says next. You did run well. 
Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? Who is the truth? Not what is the truth. Who is the truth? Christ. So then we can say, who did hinder you? Who did hinder you that you should not obey Christ? Or who should hinder you that you did not obey the Spirit? Same point. This persuasion, notice this, verse 8, this persuasion comes not of him that calls you. Who calls us? Christ, the shepherd, calls his sheep. This persuasion, this understanding, do you see what Paul is saying to the Galatians? This kind of mentality, this kind of teaching does not come from Christ. Not at all. I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about that. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. You know how many times they take this verse out of context? Understand one thing. A little bit of yeast can change the entire bread. A little bit of truth in Christ can change the entire doctrine. That's right. Christ said, beware of the Leaven of the Pharisees. Be careful of their doctrine. What is Paul saying? Be careful of this persuasion of this doctrine. These enticing words of man's wisdom. Their doctrine. For a little leaven leavens the whole lump. A little of the wrong doctrine, a little of the wrong teaching can change you entirely. But if you have a little of the of Christ teaching you, he can change you out of that entire teaching. It goes both ways. Verse 10. I have confidence in you. Through what? Through or in the Lord. Exactly. Many false pastors and churches all over the place. I have confidence in you through or in the Lord. It's in him. I have confidence in at what the Lord is doing through you and in you, that you will be none otherwise minded. Don't be any other minded except transformed and renewed in the image of Christ. Have the mind of Christ. But he that troubles you shall bear his judgment, whosoever he be. It doesn't matter what those people accuse you of. If you have the mental disposition of Christ's spirit in you, it doesn't matter what people say, and you no longer are concerned by that. And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, if I preach having a new heart, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. If you are preaching circumcision, having a new heart in Christ, why are you persecuted? Because the people persecuting you don't have that new heart experience. And who are the ones that are persecuting you the most? Those that claim to be of God, wanting to kill you in their mind with their words, with their false doctrines, which they won't let go of. And then you can know for a right sure fact that they are not born again. They are not living the life of Christ. They are not dead to self and have the reassurance of their being reborn or being resurrected into a new life in Christ. Not at all. That old life is not dead. Christ was a carpenter, right? Christ was a carpenter. But when he got baptized, was he still a carpenter? No. Nope. No, 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 no. He was not a carpenter. Paul was a Pharisee and a policeman, a man of the law. All right? A policeman in his own time. Right? But what did he get transferred into? Physically, he became a tent maker. Right? So that he could win souls and have a trade to be busy with. And he became a minister to the people. Ministering means to give freely of self without expecting anything back. An apostle means someone who is completely devout to their teacher 
in all things. They're not just a disciple. They don't just follow. They live it. They live their teaching, the teaching of their master. That's the difference between a disciple and an apostle. So he says, Then is the offense of the cross ceased. I would they were even cut off which trouble you. Anyone that is this way inclined towards you. He even says, I wish that they were cut off. They were taken out of the way. That they no longer hinder you. Notice this. Verse 13. That's the position of liberty. Now comes the practice of liberty. Love one another. For brethren, verse 13, you have been called unto liberty to exercise freedom in Christ. Because Christ says, if you're free, you're free indeed. He's made us free through baptism. Baptism in water and of the Spirit. Justified and now being sanctified. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. Don't live according to what the flesh demands through yourself, through tempted thoughts, through passions of what you desire, carnally speaking, or through the tempted thoughts and carnal passions of others, but by love serve one another. How do we serve? According to the flesh or according to the Spirit? Here comes the difference. We're going to see it in a moment. For all the law is fulfilled, including the prophets, in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. When Jeremiah himself was saying these words to Israel. Was he just being harsh? No. He was loving them by telling them the truth. As the Lord himself was dispensing it to him. It came out of him as the Lord needed to come out. But if you bite and devour one another, if there's constantly this envy, strife, division, are you not carnal and walk as men? But if you bite and devour one another, take heed, consider yourself that you be not consumed one of another. And here comes the conflict between the spirit and the flesh. Understand now very quickly what we're going to read. This I say then, Walk, not talk, not theorize, not study. Walk in the Spirit, capital S. Walk with the Spirit of the Lord in you, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh in any way, shape, or form. If you walk in the Spirit itself, the power of Christ, that power that he gives to give us in every day as we die to ourselves, which should be happening, we cannot fulfill the lust of the flesh. And it can be increment, five minutes to five minutes, can be the entire day. Let's hope that the entire day is stuck in the Lord. We must be stuck on him. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit. That's right. It was against it. Your mind and his mind wars against itself. What he desires for you and what you desire for yourself wars against itself. What you think is truth and what he is as truth is two distinct things. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. I can be tempted to do something, like I said, no, no. And I hear the Spirit of the Lord, don't do it. Let me be with you. Let me give you strength to overcome in this very moment, in this moment. And either you can obey or you can disobey. Right? Sometimes the Lord sends an attending angel to whisper the Spirit into you. That's how some people like to put it, because that's exactly what the scriptures do say, right? You have attending angels, and the angels attend you as well. You have angels that protect you, for sure. But where do you think we got the idea of a devil on your one shoulder and an angel on your other? 
That's a very real description of what does happen in the spiritual realm. Absolutely. Absolutely. If you venture into studying how the occult world works, even they know this. But I don't want to focus too much on that. We're focusing on how not to converse with them and only converse with the Lord within the inner chambers of our minds, conscious and subconscious. He must be in the temple. The high priest mustn't just be in the holy place, but the most holy place. Because the flesh wars against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other. They are contradictive. So that you cannot do the things that you would. Paul says it, that which I know to do, I don't do it. And the thing that I know I should not do, I do that thing. Was Paul not declaring straight to the Corinthians that he understands that even he is not perfect? You see, there is this idea that the disciples or the prophets were perfect. And therefore they wrote the scripture. Wrong. Wrong. It was doing as the spirit of the Lord. And he, as he was moving them, not by carrying the scriptures under their belt or arm and giving them the scripture, the spirit of the Lord literally attended out of them. First, when he first went to Galatia, the spirit ministered out of him to them real time. No scripture right there. And then he wrote a letter, which we are reading now, later to address the issues that came subsequent of them being baptized by water and in the Spirit. But it's amazing we don't see that anymore. We think this is him ministering the Spirit. No, this is a result of him being with them in flesh, as in, in their presence, as the Spirit of the Lord was moving through him. And that is to be the same experience we are to have. You could say, in a way, if it was up to the, if, if, if it was really necessary, if we were living the same way that Paul was living, the Bible would be a lot bigger. That's right. You could be able to testify to your family or friend and write a letter as the Lord moved you to really prick their hearts and convict them of where they're going wrong. And remind them of what it means to walk in the Spirit. Ah, do you understand now? The Scriptures are there to testify to your experience in the Spirit. So that you too can have the same experience that Paul was having. And you too can be used like Paul. And be perfected through the sanctification of the Spirit. Paul was being sanctified up until the day he died. We will be sanctified up until the day we die if we indeed allow the Lord to do that work. What makes us holy and righteous? Remaining in the Lord and the Lord in us. You don't know what you will be. But know this, that when he comes, you will be like him. This mortality must put on immortality. This corruption must still put on incorruption. But His Spirit through you is what helps us to overcome the flesh. His Spirit, that power. Right? And here it comes. So that you cannot do the things that you would. Verse 18. But if, if, but if, conditional words. But if you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. You are not doing it according to a precept. You're not doing it according to laws written on a page or tables of stone. You are led by the Spirit. Why? Because the Spirit, the witness, is more powerful than the Scripture or the testimony. In and of itself, Christ is more powerful than just what he has given as a record. I'm not diminishing the record. I'm telling you what its true purpose is for. So that you 
can relate to that spiritual experience in Christ. Yes, I know that there is a counterfeit spiritual experience inside the charismatic Christian churches today. Absolutely. Even what the Catholics advocate. But we're not talking about the counterfeit spiritual experience. We are talking about the true spirit of Christ. There is a difference. What are the works of the flesh? Here it is. Now we must consider ourselves here. Where do we go wrong with this? We not, we not, might not be guilty with all of them, but we might be guilty with two, three, or maybe most of them, or some, sometimes all of them. It doesn't matter if you're guilty of one. You can be guilty or led to do more. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, are revealed. Here it comes. Or are evident. Which are these? Adultery. Adultery as a whole. It's not just talking about physical adultery. How about spiritual adultery? Not being married to Christ in spirit, but be married to a false spirit with the wrong doctrine simply because you know the Bible the way you think you know it. Just saying, that is also an ap application here. Fornication. Uncleanness. Lasciviousness or licentiousness. This, and I'm going to over, I'm going to summarize it very simplistically, thinking that we have the license to do as we please. idolatry, anything you put above this spiritual experience in Christ, which comes from the Father, which should be happening daily, would be a form of idolatry. Anything you put before that. Witchcraft or sorcery, which includes word magic. What that pastor says that I want to hear, not that guy I don't want to hear. That can be witchcraft. Hatred, hating someone for whatever silly reason it might be. It could be a big reason. Variance. What is variance? Contentions. I have, I, have, I have contentions with many people, I confess. But I've learned that to have a contention constantly with a person is not going to fix anything. So what must I do? I must be patient for the Spirit of the Lord to give me victory over that contention and also to have a Spirit of the Lord, as He wills, to work over that person who also has a contention with me. Sometimes the Lord just requires me, and I'm confessing this to you, to remain silent. As a man, it's not comfortable to say this. But as someone who serves the Lord and wants His Spirit to be preeminent in my life, I confess it. Absolutely. Emulations. Jealous or jealousies. To be jealous of what someone has or what someone believes or what someone thinks or what way someone goes or any kind of form of jealousy, any kind of emulation. Wrath. The Lord says be angry but... Sin not. If you are angry and sin, that's wrath. Wrath is the manifestation of anger. Strife. Selfish ambitions. Where there is strife or envying or division, it's because one or both parties have selfish ambition. They are trying to put themselves in a place that Christ is not necessarily putting them. We have a problem. We have a big problem then. Seditions. Right? Dissensions. Need I explain that? Heresies. Envies. Murders. Drunkenness. We can be drunk, spiritually speaking, on the wrong doctrine. On the wrong wine. Revellings. Banquetings. Parties. Thinking it's all about how many times we come together and fellowship, but all at the end of the day it is, is eating and drinking and filling ourselves with the wrong kind of conversation. That's revelings. And such like, 
Exactly. He cannot. He will not. God and Christ cannot dwell in a sinful flesh temple. Exactly. Even if you have given yourself to be circumcised, as we just read, but he, that spirit is not in you, what's happening? If we keep grieving the spirit of the Lord, he will leave. So we can satisfy our own sinful temple. But if he is in us and we obey him, then that spirit and that flesh within us, that sin within us, that law, that lawlessness, wars. It must be a tug of war. And he must win. But if he's not winning, it's manifest through those individuals. And there is no love. There is no forgiveness. There is no surrender. As I've also told you in time past, as I told you before, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. You're going to go there and Christ says, sorry, I do not know you. You workers of iniquity. I don't know you. Why? Because you don't hear his voice. You don't have a relationship with him. You don't allow him to teach you things and to show you something you've never seen, even though you've read the Bible many times. He must be the one to discern. And this is what comes. The fruit of the Spirit, 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. The evidence, the, the budding. Fruit is the budding of the tree, that vine that we are connected into. It starts to produce fruit. It starts to bud, and that bud becomes fruit. And that Spirit proves, the Spirit of the Lord is proved through us when we love when we have joy, when we have peace with one another, when we have long-suffering or patience with one another, when we are gentle towards one another, or kind, should we say, when we have goodness towards one another, when we are faith or faithful one to another, meek towards one another, meekness, temperance, when we can exercise some self-control. Not go on and 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 go on. When we can exercise some self-control. From a food point of view, the opposite of temperance would be gluttony. Against such there is no law. Verse 24, And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh, put to death with the affections and lusts. If you are truly in Christ, those affections, those lusts, whether spiritual or literal, are crucified or are being crucified on a daily basis. You are daily dying to self. If we live, one, if we live in the Spirit, one, then let us walk in the Spirit, two, if we live in the Spirit, of Christ and the spirit of Christ and God lives in us, we will walk in it. You will be a living example of it. Let us not be desirous of vain glory. Let us not be conceited to think that we can achieve something lofty with our big ideas, lofty with our understanding of Scripture, going on these pulpit runs and camp meetings and making a big show of everything. No, no, no. Day to day with those around us. Otherwise, what happens? Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another and envying one another. Provoking to jealousy. Why does the Lord only use him and not me? Right? I've had, I've had that kind of conversation with many of folks. Let's see something else here. Let's go. Let's jump to Romans 13 for a moment. Let's end with a few more scriptures just to give greater validity here. Let's go to Romans quickly. Romans 13, and we're just going to read from verse 8 to 14. Paul is saying the same thing to the Romans. This is our responsibility towards each other. If we truly love, if we are walking in the Spirit then this will be the life. 
owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loves another has fulfilled the law. You are a living example of the law of selfless love. For this, thou shalt, com thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. Is that not the commandments? The moral law? And if there be any other commandment, we read that in Deuteronomy, right? The answer between God and that straight after those commandments were given. I didn't read those commandments, but they were there. Just read it before. If there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying or summarized in one point, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. How can you love your neighbor if you are not obeying the Spirit of the Lord and are giving only to yourself what you desire? Only the Spirit of the Lord can give you the strength to love your neighbor without expecting something back or some kind of recompense or some kind of acknowledgement. Love works no ill to his neighbor. Even spiritually speaking, trying to correct everyone. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. And that, by verse 11, knowing the time that now it is high time to awaken out of sleep. What kind of sleep? That you're circumcised. Now you can understand the scriptures as you read it out for yourself and know it. And now, no, 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 no. It will avail you nothing. You make Christ of none effect. You're now denying the spirit. That's what it means to grieve the spirit. Do you think that you can get there with simple, but by simply having knowledge of it? Didn't Paul say knowledge puffs up, but love edifies? If you are puffed up with knowledge, you will love no one except what you know the Lord has given you. But if you love one another, then is Christ in spirit manifested through you. Then there is no judgment to condemnation. There is only judgment to edification. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Or when we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. We should be people of the day. Not of the night. Not of spiritual darkness. But of spiritual light in Christ. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, which includes a false theological teaching. And let us be put and let us put on the armor of light. What is the armor? It's not equipping yourself with knowledge of the scripture. The scripture is testifying to you what the armor is. It is knowing that you are saved. The helmet of salvation. Right? It is knowing that you are protected with the righteousness of Christ. Your heart is fixed on Christ. Hence the breastplate of righteousness. You have the shield of faith. The Lord shields you. Because you have faith absolutely unwaveringly in Him. You have the belt of truth. You are surrounded by the Lord on all sides. You have the sword of the Spirit, which is two-edged. It has two sides to it. The Spirit is Christ and God. Did you guess that? The Spirit is the Father and the Son. You've never heard that before. It is the Father and the Son. They are the Spirit. And you have the feet, what? The feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace or the truth recorded. The gospel that you read is now lived. You are walking in the spirit. You are walking in the truth. We need this. We need it. We need to be a living example. 
Let the Spirit of Christ walk in you and do this work. Notice what it says. Let us walk honestly or let us walk properly as in the day, not in rioting or reveling and drunkenness, right? Reveling in what we know on the false doctrine of something that is a counterfeit, looks the same, but isn't the same. Not in chambering and wantonness, not in licentiousness, thinking you can now just do as you please because you have a head knowledge. And lewdness, should I explain that? Not in strife and envy or envying, but put you on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put on Christ. The word of God is who? Christ in spirit. He is the word of God. If you look up the word, word, it is the same reference that is used for the spirit. The divine expression that is Christ. Look it up in the concordance. The witness, the word of God, which is Christ in spirit, is more powerful than the testimonial evidence itself. Because there are many people in history that have been won over by the spirit of the Lord, having never read scripture. The witness is more powerful than the testimony. But now we have no excuse because we have both. But now we're trying to destroy the witness, ignorantly speaking, some willfully doing it, with the testimony. You're trying to destroy the witness with the testimony? If there was no witness, there would be no testimony. Hello? The law giver is more powerful than the law. We're not under the law of Moses. We're under the law of grace through Christ Jesus. So put on Christ Jesus. Have the oil in your lamp. And make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. If you have the Christ, Spirit of Christ walking in you, you will not fulfill the lusts of your flesh. How many Christians today read the Bible over and over again, yet they cannot have victory over the lust of the flesh? That's a big question. Because they believe more in what they see. They believe more in the scene. What they see with physical eyes, with words on a page, than what they don't see. Which is Christ with them. Christ in them. The hope of glory. Let us see something. In Ephesians 2. Let's go to Ephesians 2 for a moment. Go to Ephesians 2 for a sec and see something here. Ephesians 2. What is Ephesians 2? There it comes. Old condition, dead to God, new condition, alive to God, reconciliation of Jews and Gentiles. There it comes. And you has he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Wherein in time past, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the prince of the power of the air. See, there's power even on Satan's side, but not nearly what Christ has. The spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. The what? Satan has a spirit in people that disobey or grieve the Spirit of Christ. That's right. Among whom also you all had your conversation in time past in the lust of your flesh. Indeed, if this was a factor, he's speaking past tense, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, thinking you can get there simply by knowledge. 
and were by nature, naturally speaking, the natural man, which receives not the things of the Spirit of the Lord, according to 1 Corinthians 2. By nature, the children of wrath, even as others, you get emotional, you get angry, and you commit wrathful acts, wrathful words, saying things that you should not say, that are unseemingly for people to say, that claim to be of God's people. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when he, we were dead in our sins, even when we were dead in our sins, even though we are lawless, has quickened us together with Christ, with Him. It's Christ. We don't lead ourselves. He leads us. Or He pulls us where He wants to go. By grace you are saved. You're not saved by knowledge. You're not saved by circumcision alone. You are saved by grace. And hath raised us up together and made us. He makes us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. For they are ever thinking about us. That in the ages to come. Paul is speaking then. We are now in those ages. In those ages to come. He might show the exceeding riches of his grace. In his kindness towards us. Through. What? The scripture? It's not what it's saying. Through Christ Jesus. Through the spirit of the Lord. Through the word of God. Himself. For by grace. Are you saved through faith? You are saved by the grace of the Father through the faith of His Son, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, a gift you don't make yourself. You don't gift yourself by having the Bible and now trying to understand it, and now you've gifted, now you're gifted. No, no, no. It must be given by the Spirit of the Lord. He gives you the gift. What gift? The riches of of wisdom and knowledge in Christ Jesus. He gives you the discerning spirit as to what the Bible is actually saying to you and to me. And more. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. If it is of ourselves, that's what institutions are. Of ourselves. It was never... The Lord's order to bring about institutions. In fact, show me one reformer that officially started an institution. There's none. Even Ellen White and the pioneers of Adventism didn't start an institution. They were actually against a general conference and leaders of a conference. Did you know that? The order was to be simple. Let the Spirit lead you, lead you, and He will lead you through the Scripture alone. And you will also understand the validity of the Spirit of prophecy and the testimonies to the church as a warning to you, the individual, as to make sure you don't make the mistakes those people made. And to know the working of Satan so that you are not tempted by Satan to fulfill the lust of your flesh or the lust of your own mind. Verse 9, not of works, meaning our own works, lest any man should boast. Look at what I've done. Look at what ministry I have. Look how many followers we have. Stop trying to steal my followers. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has ordained before that we should walk in it. Walk, not talk. Not read only, but actually live it. You're supposed to live it. <laughs> you can read it and think about it and talk about it all you want. Are you living it? Are you walking in the Spirit of the Lord? I'll say it again. Are you walking in the Spirit of the Lord? That does not talk. I'm not talking about Scripture. Scripture is confirming this. Are you walking in the Spirit of of Jesus Christ? Is he literally, spiritually, miraculously speaking, in you, living in you, doing the work mightily through you? 
If you don't believe that's going to happen, then you don't believe the you don't won't believe the following words. Notice this. Wherefore, remember that you being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, without who, without Christ being aliens or strangers from the commonwealth of, of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise. When did he make the covenant of promise? Abraham, Adam and Eve, the sacrificial system. Adam and Eve didn't even have a Ten Commandment law in front of them to Moses, did they? No, they had it already known to them by the Spirit of the Lord back then. And having no hope and without God in this world. But now in Christ, you who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ, by his sacrifice. Now has he been glorified so that he can literally be in you, spiritually speaking. It's not his humanity in coming you. He's not merging himself or fusing himself into you as a man. That's ridiculous. He is the Spirit of the Lord. He is made of twain, His humanity and His divine life, which He had before the world was. Lord, Father, glorify me with Thine own self as I had before I came into this world, before the world was. John 17, 5. And we are partakers, as it says in Tim and Peter, we are partakers of His divine nature, His spiritual nature. For he is our peace, who has broken, made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished, here it comes, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, the war between God and us as people, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. That's the whole Pentateuch. That is the ordinances. For to make in himself of twain to one new man. He's a new man in heaven. Why? Because he is a man, but he's also a spiritual being. That's right. He has the spiritual power of his father in him to still do it. It doesn't matter the how. The matter is that it is. So making peace that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. For through him, through Christ, we both have access by one spirit, not another, a power unto the Father. Now therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together as his spirit leads us grows unto a holy temple in the Lord. That's who we are. We are all little temples in whom you also are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit or through Christ's spiritual divine nature. How do we know this? Look in the next chapter, which in verse 5, and I'll read from verse 5 to verse 7, who in other, Ephesians 3, same, same book, next chapter, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, Christ, the divine Son of God, who is that Spirit to us, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. And here it comes. How do we know its power? Notice this. Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. 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 Are we getting it now? I'm saying it sternly 
because it needs to be understood. There must be such conviction in you. You must get it now. I do not wish for anyone to be lost. I get it. I believe it. I believe that the power is far more important than just words on a page. If we don't have the power, you won't understand these words. We need the power of the Spirit of Christ. Without the true power of God, 1 Corinthians 124, Jesus Christ, the wisdom of God and the power of God. Hello. If we don't have that power, you are none of his. I'm saying it. I'm warning. Now I'm warning. It is to be taken seriously. And it's to be said in a stern manner. Because if we want to behave like children, you'll be treated like children. And when I, what, what kind of children? Children of disobedience. My child, when she disobeys, I give her a hiding. If I follow in the spirit of the Lord and others around me are not taking it seriously, I want to make fun about me. That's okay. But if I do a teaching, the Lord is giving you a spiritual hiding through me. And you can reject it like you like the prophets were rejected. You can reject it as the Lord reject, as many people reject, people reject, sorry, the pioneers of Adventism and white, for example. But guess what? They got their spiritual hiding. Nonetheless, whether they took it seriously and carried on in their pernicious ways, that's between them and the Lord on the day of judgment. Don't mock God. You can mock the man all you want, but you cannot mock the spirit of the Lord that works in me. Absolutely not. Right? And the same is for you. If any one of you are walking in the spirit of the Lord, no one can mock you. They, they judge according to the flesh. Let them judge according to the flesh. So what? God is a respecter of no man's person. He doesn't care what you think. He doesn't care what you feel. He cares that you obey the spirit of his son in spirit by that power that's what it means to grieve the spirit that's exactly what it means let us read three more examples and finish let us go to one peter quickly and see what he said here how do we overcome the lust of the flesh and of the mind by remaining in the spirit of the lord by remaining in the spirit of christ jesus and been fixed that he knows how to execute his power through us. That that word that he's spoken to us in spirit, our minds, because the word spirit means what? Breath, wind, mind, life. So for the sake of emphasis, the mind of Christ, the spirit of the Lord, if we are obedient to the spirit of the Lord, the mind of Christ, his mind with our mind, and bearing so that our mind die, our minds die because it's fleshly and natural in its thinking, and his spirit is alive in us because it is of, of eternal importance and substance, then we believe it. 1 Peter 4. 1 Peter 4. And we're just going to read 1 to 6. Same point. Peter is saying the same thing. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. Did I not just say that? For he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. You have ceased from lawlessness. You no longer want to live your life according to the lust of your flesh or according to the lawless, pernicious ways of your own thinking, thinking that you can understand what law is, thinking that you can live the law out according to your own understanding. It is the law that, that if that is the way you want to do it, you will be judged by that law. Then you better be, then you better keep not just the Pentateuch, the entire scriptures in your own strength. You better be a better example than Christ. Because if you're not, which we know no one can be, you are fallen from grace. Then you don't understand it. For he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in this world in the flesh to the lusts of men, according to the lusts of themselves or to any kind of lust or enticement or doctrine or theology or whatever it is from anyone else but to the will of God. How do you know the will of God? 
just by a testimonial scripture when it's already been cropped it out to mean so many different things. People have taken the scriptures out of context for so long. How can you just trust and only trust what men tell you they think the Bible says? The only way you know what the real will of God is, if it's confirmed to you or led to you in the spirit of Christ. That's why we need the power of the spirit. Not the counterfeit, the true, Christ himself. For the Father seeketh such to worship him, to have true worshippers that worship them in spirit and inclusive of and in truth. It's two, not one. It's two. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles, that we walked in licentiousness or lasciviousness, lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, which we just read in Galatians, does not is not seemingly for those that apparently call themselves Christians, wherein they think it's strange. Those even in the Christian community will think it's strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot or dissipation, speaking evil of you. Let them. You're not doing this as a popularity contest. You're doing this in singleness of heart to the Lord as a good conscience towards the Lord. Who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick, the living, and the dead? For for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, spiritually dead, that they might be judged according to the men in the flesh. They can judge us in the flesh, fine, but live according to God in the spirit, small s, According to God in the mind. We know that we are his. And he knows that we are, we are his. He knows it. Second Peter 2. Second Peter 2. He has a description of false teachers. This is what the counterfeit. Or people that have believed the counterfeit will say to you, this is how they will live. This is how they will talk. This is how they will do it. Here it comes. Anyone, don't just look to religious leaders. Anyone who claims to be a Christian that does not have the Spirit of the Lord leading them, their lives do tell that they are slaves to the lusts of the flesh. Here it comes. But chiefly, them that walk according or after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government. There's the first one for you. They despise the government or they despise authority, any authority. Right? Presumptuous are they, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignities or dignitaries. Anyone that has been put in a position that the Lord has ordained. We do not, I do not speak against Donald Trump. I see that he's used by the enemy. I don't create anarchy against him. Or should I say, in my case, Ramaphosa. I, I know that he's been led by the enemy because of the policies that he's pushing out. But I don't fight against him. I don't disregard the authority the Lord has put him into. I just disagree with these policies. I don't fight against the flesh and the blood, the man that has been appointed. I fight against the principality and the power itself because it's not of a spiritual import. It's not led by Christ. It's led by the spirit of the enemy. It's a spiritual battle, not a physical one, not a political one, not an agenda-based one. Presumptuous are they. Verse 11, whereas angels, angels, the messengers that speak to us, which are greater in power and might against us, bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord. The angels that are to attend them, they don't do that. But these, as natural brute beasts, made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understand not. <clears throat> Why do they not understand it? Because it's not given to them in spiritual discernment by the Spirit of Christ. They're trying to understand it within their own validity. 
within their own thinking. That's These are qualifying markers. What we're reading here are qualifications of false individuals or false teachers, people that are trying to teach or trying to preach or trying to give what they think is truth. Doesn't matter who it is. Don't just worry about the people in the pulpit. It can be people amongst us. Yes, exactly. The Lord can use whom he will. And right now, and like he's done in history, he's always used the nobodies. He uses the nobodies more. Why? Because they're constantly oppressed by the somebodies. It is the somebodies, the qualified, learned, educated people that are actually the most disqualified to actually be used by the Lord. Why? Because they care only for the things of the flesh, to be seen of men, to have a certification, to be glorified by men, and they teach for commandments and doctrines of men. Taking the scripture out of context, not having the spirit of the Lord, thereby reprobate in their minds. Disqualified. And their lives will tell. Body language, as an expression I can tell you for, for, my, for myself, body language never lies. People will always show you in their expression, in their tone, in their manifestation of how they live every day and how they treat their neighbors, how they treat their family, how they treat everyone, you will know. Especially when you have the discerning spirit of the Lord. But the way you deal with it changes. If you are just like them, you will fight tit for tat. As Christ said, an eye for an eye, right? But I tell you, he replaced Matthew 5, 6, and 7, he was replacing the entire Pentateuch with his Sermon on the Mount. He says, I tell you, quoting the Pentateuch, an eye for an eye. But I tell you, he who loves his neighbor turns the other cheek. How many Christians actually do that? Yes, told us to love our enemies and pray for them. There's no eye for an eye or tooth for a tooth. That's the difference between being under Mount Sinai, the mountain of death, and being under Mount Zion, which is in heaven, under the mountain of life. The law of Moses versus the law of grace. He gave it as a point. Why? Because the Jews were under pagan worship and rule. They had forgotten the promises made to Abraham, their forefather. So he had to give it to them real time. But even those precepts and those ordinances became a legalistic matter, which they used to try and hammer Christ and even crucified him with the law of Moses. And he said, if you believed Moses, if you actually understood what Moses was trying to say and what Moses' words are actually advocating, that there are types and ordinances of me, then you would believe me. But today, people don't do that. They don't believe it. They think that it's, they think it's not a new covenant. It's a renewed one. Oh, no. Now you're changing literally one tittle of the law, Chaldean Hebrew, to suit your personalized understanding. God is a respecter of no one's person. Not even that. But it goes on. They understand not, verse 12, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. They have corrupted themselves and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to riot in the day. Right? To make a big noise about it. Right? Go and try and convert everyone with it. Spots they are and blemishes, sporting themselves. Right? Reveling in themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. Right? There is no growth. They stuck on the same point over and 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 over again. But there's no growth. There's no wisdom of Christ revealing to them prophecy, revealing to them a greater understanding and a manifestation of love that starts to overflow to anyone and everyone. Doesn't matter the culture, the language, the creed, the people. Verse 14, having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin. 
literal adultery and spiritual adultery. It's amazing how we've listened to pastors, believed so many pastors <clears throat> and teachers that are even divorced or slept with another person's daughter or another man's wife and vice versa. But even more importantly, they are not married to Christ in spirit. They don't have the oil in their lamps, those wise virgins for the Lord. They have lamps with no oil. And they're being kept away from the feast. They will not join in. They are outside weeping and gnashing teeth. Having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin or lawlessness, beguiling unstable souls. Did you catch that? Beguiling unstable souls. Enticing people that are not stable within themselves in Christ. Our heart they have exercised or trained with covetous practices, cursed children. Even those that try and keep feasts. They are thinking that they can please God by keeping a feast that was already fulfilled in Christ. For goodness sake, the temple curtain was rent. They are cursed children. Even going by false names that don't, don't exist in scripture, which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray. Following the way of ba 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 uh, uh, Balaam, the son of Basor. What happened with Balaam? And the donkey. Whoa, you read that story. We are guilty of the same. Going about to do our want, but not realizing the Lord is actually hindering us from going where we want. And he's trying to say, mm -mm, and he'll use nature to take its course against you. Who loved the wages of unrighteousness. But was rebuked for his iniquity. The dumb ass speaking with man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. These are wells without water. The woman at the well. Christ must be the well. He said, if you drink, drink water, yeah, you'll drink again and again and again. You'll keep partaking in that false doctrine. The leaven, the wine, the water, whichever. Same point. Different words, same point. And you will not get fullness in wisdom and knowledge. Clouds that are carried with a tempest. Right? Carried with this, mm, I will go and do it. Yes. Ah, mm, you must learn. Yes, yes, yes. Right? To whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. They have a mound clouded. They have a, they have a cloud, a cloudy mind. They see through a glass darkly still. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, of emptiness, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness or much licentiousness, those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. That are indeed escaped from them who live in error. While they promised them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. You cannot serve Christ and serve the flesh. You cannot serve the law of grace if you're still under the law of Moses. I'm just using that as a reference. You cannot serve the spirit of Christ if you think it's only out of the word or the law of scripture. Pick one. It's the same point. <clears throat> For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage. The yoke of bondage, which we just read none of. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein. And overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. You can be circumcised, but if you think you can get yourself there, you will entertain the lust of your flesh. You will entertain your own thoughts and you can slap Christ on it all that you want. You are resisting the spirit that must give it to you. Invisibly speaking. And your end will be worse than your beginning. 
For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, quote in Proverbs 26 verse 11, the dog is turned to his own vomit, his own teaching, his own understanding of scripture or spirit of prophecy. And the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Last scripture, 1 John 2, and only three verses, and we'll end. 1 John 2. 1 John 2, verses 15 and 17. It comes right after loving one another. Read the whole of 1 John 2. Obeying his commandments, 3 to 6 and 7 to 14, is the love for one another. But I'm going to end on the punchline. Verse 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, that include that includes the false doctrine of the teachings of Scripture. The love of the Father. So, sorry, that, that, that are in the world. If any man love the world or the false teachings that are advocated in the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You cannot overcome the lusts of the flesh, which are of the mind and of the body. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Lust of the flesh. Fleshly things, inside, outside. Our minds, our lives, our bodies. The lust of the eyes. Covetousness. To desire what other people have that you can never attain to because you weren't there or you never studied or whatever it what is. The pride of life. Thinking that you can know what life is about, everlasting life more specifically. Without the Spirit of the Lord giving, it is not of the Father. It is of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof. But he that does the will of God, he that hears the Spirit of the Lord, that knows the Word himself, that hears the Word attending him, that gives him understanding of the scriptures and of the spirit of prophecy, abides forever. It starts now. It starts today. It starts and ends in Christ. Christ is the author and finisher of our faith in spirit and in truth. Otherwise, we have no way of overcoming. If you're trying to save yourself, but what you think the Bible says, according to what a man has pitched, and not allow the Spirit of the Lord to attend you, you can, and most likely will, be lost. This is a warning. This is a reminder. This is a teaching that the Lord is preeminent. And that we need the Spirit of the Lord, which is more powerful than anything. And we need Him to give us discernment over the truth, over what we read in Scripture and Spirit of Prophecy. And to live as people that live just as Christ lived. Amen? That's the message for today. Let the Lord confirm it for you personally, individually. Don't take what comes out of my mouth. Let the Lord reveal it to you in your own mind within the study that he leads you through scripture and become a living standard. Obey not the flesh, not the lusts of your mind, but obey the spirit of the Lord and let him be in charge of your life. Amen. Let's pray. Thank you, dear Heavenly Father in Heaven. How marvelous you are, Father. And how marvelous your Son is, sitting on your right hand, 
being made all things for mankind. That he is the wisdom that we need. That he is the power that we need. For by your spirit, by your son, we have all things. And we can gain all things. That you too can reveal to us the hidden treasures, treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And to teach and preach and prophesy and edify and lift up to love one another. Not just in word, but in deed and in truth. And allow Christ to be preeminent through us daily as we die to ourselves. That he will give us victory. That he will give us the ability to overcome all fleshly things. Whether in ourselves or even through others. Whether in whatever is advocated through the system. Which is advocated through teachers, so-called. Lord, that we may understand all the doctrinal issues because we have a relationship with you through your Son, Christ Jesus. And we thank you for attending this study. We thank you for, your, for letting the, the ears and the hearts of everyone that has partaked in this study, that they will hear it and see it for what it is. And most importantly, that they will taste that the Lord is good for themselves. That they too may have that spiritual power experienced through Christ. And that they also will have a true knowledge of the scriptures and of prophecy. And be ready to meet him in the clouds of glory and not to be ashamed at all. Lord, we know that we will be cursed and rebuked and reviled and accused falsely for this living experience. Not this theoretical one, this practical one. Help us to bear about all the persecution and to bear one another's burdens and to look after one another. Father, you seek true worshipers that worship you in spirit and in truth. Help us to have both you and your son, invisibly and visibly, but that we focus on the invisible, the eternal things, not just the visible temple things. And we thank you in the name and power of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for joining. Hope it's been a blessing. God bless.